Okay, so the theme of this week's guitar lesson is take your time. If I can stress any point, it's to take your time, let notes ring out, let, the, let there be space in between notes, let it all breathe. This is a big part of learning to play, especially if you're wanting to write music and you're, or you're wanting to play along with other people, you're wanting to improvise. The, the best musicians are ones that really get this and, and do this well. And to me, my, my favorite guitar work, when I hear it in music, I kind of forget that there's even a guitar there. It just fits in so perfect to the overall that you, you're not even hearing it in a way, which is kind of weird. It's sort of counter to what we would think we want to do. Uh, but it's more like thinking of the, your guitar part like one of the ingredients in the thing that you're trying to make. Uh, you know, the dish that you're trying to make, as opposed to the dish already being made and then you're injecting something in at, sort of at the end of it. Sometimes you'll hear a solo that sounds like, it sounds like a solo, like somebody's trying to do something that's impressive. And I don't know, they're sort of, they're not serving the song, I guess. And so anyway, that's what we're going to be talking about, some of that, uh, you know, space in between notes and just letting notes ring out. And we're going to be doing this uh, across uh, two videos. So in this video, we're going to go through the first half of the lead. We'll talk about everything I played there. We'll talk about the tone that I'm using. So I'll go through my sound setup and all of that. Uh, if you'd like to join us for the part two video where we go over the second half, download the MP3 jam track and get the tablature for all of this so that you can practice playing everything we're going to talk about. You can get all of that material by going to activemelody.com, go to the weekly lessons page, and do a search for EP568. Okay, let's start off and talk about tone, which I seem to forget a lot of times. I always get corrected on that. But um, So the guitar that I'm using is a Gibson Birdland, and or Birdland. Um, a lot of times people will leave a comment saying, what kind of 335 is that? It's not a 335, it's a Gibson Birdland. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to go out and buy a Gibson Birdland to get this sound. You don't have to have that at all. You can get this sound with any electric guitar. Uh, the, the key to the sound is actually coming from the effects that I'm using. So I'm playing through a Line 6 Helix. That's what I have on the floor. And the first, there's going to be four things. Uh, the first is a little bit of overdrive. You don't have to have a Line 6 Helix either, by the way. These are basic pedals and things that you can acquire and you can get from other things. So the first is a little overdrive. So this is the signal without any delays or anything, just the overdrive. And it's actually quite a bit of breakup. It's surprising. So if you go back and listen to what I play in the intro, it sounds soft and pretty. You don't hear that overdrive. But that's the sound I was using in the intro. And the reason you want that overdrive is for sustain. When you have a little overdrive in the sound, it just sustains and it just, the notes will ring out better than if if there's it's a too clean channel. Okay, so the first effect is plate reverb, which sounds like this. So when you add that reverb to that overdriven sound, you're already getting a pretty cool uh, thing. Now, so I, I mentioned that's a plate reverb. You can use whatever reverb if you've got a pedal or you've got it built into your amp. But anyway. That's the sound, if you want to try and match that. Now, this is the coolest effect. One of my favorite for this kind of slow, spacey stuff, it's a tremolo. So it sounds like this. Hear the little shimmer in the sound? And tremolo has kind of two uh, variables to, to play with. One is the, the depth of that wave. And the other is the frequency, like how fast. Do you want it to go really fast or kind of slow? So uh, that's a tremolo. You can get tremolo pedals. It's very common. There's a million of them out there. I don't have any that I'd recommend. They all kind of do the same thing, roughly. So the other effect is a little bit of delay. I don't usually use delay, but it sounds like this. You can really hear it when it when it rings out. Now here, that's the delay. So if you've got a delay pedal, you can set the feedback and the uh, the, the timing to match that if you want. You don't have to do that. But anyway, I don't want. I just wanted to mention that. That's kind of the sound that I'm using for this, which is not something I normally do. This is sort of out of my comfort zone on on tone. I usually just go for a little bit of overdrive, a little bit of reverb. That's it for 90% of what I do. Um, okay, 
so now that we've got that out of the way, the chords, let's talk about those. Uh, there's gonna be four chords, it's a G chord. Then it goes to an E minor, which is your relative minor, the sixth chord. Then D, five chord. A minor, which is your two. So those are the chords we're gonna be playing over. G, E minor, D, and A minor. All right, let's listen to this first phrase and we'll break it down. Okay, so that first chord is a G chord and what I played over that goes like this. I mean, how lame is that in terms of technique, in terms of, you know, theory? There's really nothing there. I'm just playing the chord. But I thought it sounded good. And it just sort of, it fits in perfectly. It doesn't sound like a guitar solo. It actually sounds like more of a rhythm part, if anything. So what I'm doing is I'm playing the G chord up here in the C shape. So we're thinking cage system. So this would be my G chord in the C shape, which would look like that. But I'm not playing the full chord. I'm just doing this little triad here. It's real easy to do. You just bar on the seventh fret, strings one through four, and then ring finger on the ninth fret, fourth string, middle finger on the eighth fret, second string. So I play that and it comes in on the and of three. So for those of you that are playing along with the jam track, it's one and two and three and. Okay, now after that I went. Now that one note change makes a huge difference. It pulls your ear in a whole different direction without it sound feel, feeling exhausting or feeling like, you know, there's a lot to try and listen to. It's very easy listening, you know? So what I'm doing for that is I'm just lifting my middle finger. That's it. Now when I play that, uh, I'm playing. So if you listen to just that, it sounds kind of sad. Well, it's actually, it's a minor triad. It's a B minor triad. So the big question of the day is, so wait a minute, we were playing over a G chord, right? And we played the G chord itself like that. So then when I went to that B minor triad, while the song was still, just for a few seconds, it's still playing over the G chord there. Why would that work? Why would that B minor triad work over a G chord? And the answer is, I'm playing a G major seven chord when I do that. So if the song, if the band is playing a G chord and you play a B minor triad on top of that G chord, you're gonna get this sound. It's cool, isn't it? It's very spacey, it's very pretty. Now you can get a lot of mileage out of a major seven chord like that, especially in something that's kind of slow and mellow like this. Now here's a super easy formula to find that minor triad if you want to find it anywhere on the fretboard. You take your major triad, right? Any major triad, so that's my G major triad, and then where your, your root note is, the G note, you just go down one fret. You leave your other two fingers open. Like that, that's it. That's that minor triad that works over a G, right? And I was doing that same thing up here. I was playing my G chord, and when I lifted my middle finger and played this, I just went down one fret from the root. That's it. So that worked over the G, but then the song goes into the E minor, and I just let that minor triad ring out through the E minor. So the big question is, why would that B minor triad work when there's a, an E minor chord underneath it? And the answer is, if you're playing an E minor chord and then somebody else plays a B minor triad, what you're actually creating when you put those two chords together is an, a minor nine chord. So I'm playing an E minor nine chord when I do that. That's an E minor nine. Isn't it amazing how this minor triad, if there's a G in the bass, you have a major kind of spacey sounding chord. If there's an E in the bass, you have kind of a spacey minor sounding chord. So that's that E minor nine. If there's the B in the bass, you just have the plain old you know minor chord. So you get all these different tonalities and colors uh, by letting chords kind of ring out. So that's why if you've never tried this, just take a jam track. You can take this one, in fact, 
play a note or play a couple of notes or maybe even a little triad or a chord and just let it ring out and see what happens when the next chord comes by in the jam track. Sometimes they'll color themselves in beautiful ways like this, and this is just one of those examples. I know we haven't done much musically yet. We've done this and this, but that's saying a lot. So then after that I went So I just played that uh, B minor triad again. Put my middle finger back down on the 8th fret 2nd string. And then I went like this. That's where the song goes to the D chord. And I just played strings 2 and 3 on the 7th fret. Now why would that work? Um, be over a D chord. Well think about your D chord. Let's look at our D chord using the A shape. Going back to the cage system here. Look at where that little triad is. Oh yeah, that's it, right? There's the triad. Those are the two notes that I played. So what I'm doing by playing this lead is I'm doing so little in terms of movement and in terms of introducing new notes even. I'm just trying to stay on the same notes as long as I can and let the chords underneath it dictate the sound and the, and the colors and the pretty, you know, the, the vibe of the whole thing. So... That's the first thing I did over the G, over the E minor, over the D. So when I'm playing this, that's over that D chord as well. So I'm holding down this triad, there's my D triad, and I'm playing on strings four and three, those two strings, and I've got this hammer on going with my ring finger up on the ninth fret, fourth string. A little palm muting with the right hand as well. Now that's just really an embellishment off of your D chord. Right? And, and this is the kind of stuff I've talked about several times where you've got your D chord using the A shape and then the D chord up here using the G shape. And in this uh, shape, I've got all these embellishments between, in this case, the seventh fret and the ninth fret. So that's all this is. Um, for, for the D chord. Then the song goes to the A minor chord and to keep things minimal, I slide down two frets and I play it. I'm doing the same thing I did here for the D. And when I slide down two frets though, I'm playing over the A minor chord, and the reason that works, look at this. There's my A minor chord using the E minor shape. Ah, you get see it? Okay, so there, yeah, so it's here, so. That's just an embellishment off of that shape. Right? So, this entire lead up to this point, Those last two notes are 7th fret 5th string, 5th fret 4th uh, string. Um, but it's very minimal. Uh, it's really just repeating a lot of the same stuff. Okay, so now the song repeats. We go back to the G chord. And this was the last note that I played, right? Right, that fifth fret, fourth string. So now I'm gonna take that and play that same note. I'm just gonna replace it and put my ring finger there so that I can reposition my hand. And then watch this. So I did that to represent my G chord. Now here's the big takeaway in this. So first of all, I ended with this, which is my G chord, right? This is my G chord using the E shape, by the way. This is the, the area, the box that I'm playing within. 
from the cage system. So I'm starting on this G note here, this fifth fret fourth string, and then I play this. So I've got my index finger on the second fret third string. It's kind of a stretch there. It'd probably be smarter for me to use my pinky on the fifth fret, but that's what I'm doing. So that's how I play that. All right, so here's a big takeaway in this position. I love this. Now remember, we're in the E shape here. So I'm gonna hold down uh, the fifth fret fourth string, that G note with my ring finger, and I'm gonna play the entire G major scale, but uh, accent this G note here. I'm gonna re reference this G note each time I hit a note. You'll see what I mean, and you'll get these different sounds. Some of them will be pretty and har harmonized. Some of them will be kind of dissonant. So listen to this. But listen to each one of those, and those intervals in between. That's just an octave, but listen. Isn't that cool? Like, I could work with that. I could get a lot out of that. The seventh interval and the root. So weird. So anyway, I'm just mentioning that because as I started this, that's where that kind of came from, was that idea of just walking up up the major scale. But when you pit two notes together like that, you get the real pretty stuff, harmonies and dissonant sounds. Okay, so then the song goes to the E minor, and I, I played using that same scale, because why not? E minor and G share the same scale. Remember, E minor is the relative minor of G. So, so I went and played that over the E minor, uh, going into the D, and landed on that D note. And then I came down here and played. Let me show you those notes there, starting with my pinky on the fifth fret first string. And then we're gonna do a full bend and release on the fifth fret second string. Right? Come down to the uh, third fret second string. And then watch this. So three, five on the second string, third fret first string down to the 5th fret 2nd string. Now all of those notes work perfectly over the D chord, which is happening in the song right now, because those are in the D major pentatonic scale. In my mind, if I'm playing a chord out of this C shape, I see this major pentatonic scale pattern 4, which is right there in that shape. It's just something that's married in my brain. And I'll put a lesson up on the screen for those of you that want to deep dive into the C shape and uh, you can see what I'm talking about there. But... So that's what I played to represent that D chord in the song. Then the song goes back to the A minor and I played... And this is just my A minor in first position. That's all I was thinking about there. So think of, play your A minor in first position. Take your index finger off. Start on the fourth string and go four, three, two. So you get that sus sound, the sus two. And then add your index finger to the first fret second string. And then there's a slide on the second string from the third fret up to the fifth fret. And then I came down and landed on the uh, third fret second string. So all together that A minor lick sounds like that. All right, so that's a lot of information already crammed into this part one video. Come join us in part two where we'll go over the second half of the lead. It goes into a different part of the song, so we take the chords and we rearrange them a little bit just to make it sound more interesting. Um, and then I'll throw in a C chord in there as well. 
and we'll play some different things over those chords. So come join us for part two where we'll go over the rest of this. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel yet, I would encourage you to do that. Just click the subscribe button and then the alert bell so that you can be notified when I put out new lessons, which I do every week. Also leave a comment below and let me know if you like this lesson or you had any breakthroughs or if any of this is not clear. I'm always interested to read that stuff. It helps me shape what I'm doing going forward. All right, we'll see you in part two.